separate, uh, and then add in the variable costs as you continue to grow. Uh, so as we started to think about these kinds of things, uh, we began our conversation in the summer of 2012 or 13, it's all becoming a blur for me now, with could we do a master's degree for $1,000? And I'm very serious, that's where we started. Sounds ludicrous. But it allowed us to step back and break every single assumption that we had about higher ed and the cost structures of our programs. And really say, do we need this? If we don't, why are we building it into the program and therefore let's not make it part of the cost structure. If we do, then let's figure out how much it costs, fixed and variable, and put it into the program. And that allows us to step back and really think about those things. It allows us to differentiate then why our at scale program is a different price point, different experiences than perhaps our residential program, even though the pedagogy is identical. Same faculty, same course outcomes, same assessments, everything. But the experiences around it, to Yakut's earlier point, education is more than content delivery. Some of those things are different. Uh, so looking at number of sections, looking at marketing costs, uh, this year I was just looking at the OMSCS budget, year six. Um, I, I won't ask, we don't have time. The marketing budget for OMSCS was 50K. We've spent 22. Now that's not the same in programs two and three. Program one benefits from having more than a thousand articles written about it. Uh, two public speeches by the then President Obama. Um, so we got a lot of free lift thank you world, uh, to make these things happen. Uh, but we highly use our corporate networks to share this information through their own HR systems about the programs. So there's some social media things that we're learning in terms of how to promote these things. We don't necessarily need to go out to print and put out postcards and all kinds of other things for an online degree. Uh, but yet that's the way our, some, you know, History is tough to change. It's what, easier to change the course of history than a history course. Um, so uh, w we need to think about those kinds of things. Uh, what's in the student services? What's in financial aid? What's in career services? All these kinds of things have to be thought about. So are we going to self-fund this? So there's lots of places to look in terms of self-funding. Uh, what are the partnership models? So and when we first did the first one, I said Udacity, or sorry, AT&T was a huge benefactor for us. Udacity was our, our MOOC platform partner. Uh, they too invested because they too were at the table with us as we were going through the pedagogy and business models. And so it was a shared risk contract. Uh, we shared revenue after net. We still, to this day, build collective budgets signed off by them and us in terms of what's going to be built into the program because we're still learning. And we make cases to each other as to why we want to add whatever to the program into the cost structure. And then we share net. The other agreements that we have are sharing gross, much like most of the traditional models. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both. But figuring these kinds of things out, what's in partnership and what can you self-fund, and what are you starting to self-fund or what will you self-fund next year uh, as you start to have those institutional strategies uh, to make things happen. So I also want to give huge accolades to another one of uh, my leadership team, Patrice Miles. She's the Assistant Dean for Finance and Operations, sits alongside Yakut and I, along with uh, other very competent individuals. It's her team that have largely put these slides together and I'd be very remiss to not give them credit. Uh, for the slides in which you're about to see. Eye chart. Told you there would be some eye charts. Uh, we're going to explode each of these in just a little bit, and I don't mean that in the sense of blow them up, but I mean actually, you know, make them bigger for you to see. But there's two key components here uh, to the, the financial summary or model summary. The first is enrollment. All of our university systems look backwards. I made the statement yesterday, it's like driving down the highway looking in the rearview mirror. Budget systems, every, you know, how many people enrolled last term? That doesn't help me at all. I need to know how many people might enroll next term. Because as I'm adding a thousand students a term, I gotta have some idea how many people are coming so I can build the ecosystem and have the staffing in place and whatnot because I just can't go out and hire somebody to start tomorrow. 
uh, in a state system to be able to do hiring in HR. So I've got to have systems that look forward. There are no systems that look forward, so how do we figure that out? So the team put together some enrollment projections. I've got a, a marketing research group in my, in my organization uh, that have access to data and outsourced individuals and whatnot that does market research. Uh, we have to build things and have some idea of what's happening and then track to those projections. Uh, I made the comment earlier, analytics is actually running ahead of those projections. That's good news for me in some ways because I know the revenue is coming, bad news in others and that I need to build things faster than I thought I needed to. Uh, if the enrollment check projections don't keep pace, then I have to make other kinds of decisions. But I have that roadmap now of where I thought I needed to add resources into the program and I can compare it to where I am. The second one, which is kind of at the bottom, and Yakut's video feed is over, it is cost structure. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that. So what goes into those costs, those fixed and variable costs and whatnot. The financial model in the middle obviously blends those two together because the enrollment projections, the revenue side, and the cost structure is the cost side. And you do the math, you take all the pluses and subtract all the minuses, uh, and you end up with a model summary on the right-hand side. So we have these dashboards that we've been using that try to, to give us a month-to-month -month snapshot of where are we. And yeah, we look at them month-to-month. -month. Uh, we report them quarterly internally through the university. Uh, and what really changes is semester by semester. Uh, because these students also are on the semester-based system. They start when our semesters start. Uh, they end when our semesters end. Uh, and that's just how we've done it. Uh, it's not a cohort base, so we see students starting and stopping at their leisure, which is another part of the challenge because the individuals in this category, life gets busy and they decide they're going to stop out for a while because they've got something to do. Oh, but we got this policy over here. If you stopped out for two semesters, you got to reapply. Uh, I really don't want that hit in social media. Um, so how do I identify those people who have stopped out for two and I raise my hand and say, hey, when you decide to come back, can we talk to you before you make application because there's some other ways in which we can help get you back in. But it's having those kinds of capabilities to identify them, reach them, and have those kinds of conversations. Uh, so one of the things that we did when we launched analytics, just as an aside to that point, uh, we launched at the same time, and looking back, I think we were crazy, but we've done lots of crazy things. Uh, we launched a CRM system at the same time, because uh, we didn't have one. Uh, so how do we build these kinds of relationships around students and know who they are? Uh, it's more than an SIS. You need a lot more than just what courses are they taking. Uh, and so other universities have them, we didn't. Uh, and so we're building those at the same time. So when you sit here and you look at uh, a Master's of Science uh, in terms of things and expenses, so this is that expense chart and it's actually blown up into three different slides, still an eye chart. Uh, and um, we're now having a conversation, did we include everything that we should have included? Because we're now learning throughout the university that there are some expenses that we did not anticipate. So there are more applications coming in for these programs, these three, than the rest of the applications to the university. Who's handling all of them? We didn't build them into the budget. Uh, we did it to them. So how can we fix that? Um, software costs. All credit-bearing students at Georgia Tech get certain access to software licenses uh, as, as a function of being a, a degree-seeking student. Uh, we didn't build that in either. Uh, and we have to go back and fix that. So our conversation wasn't broad enough when we first started and we're, we're trying to go back and fix it. But when we look at these kinds of things, you need program directors, you need academic folks, you certainly need faculty, you need TAs, you need software, you need licenses, you need CR, and the list goes on and on and on in terms of the kinds of things that you need. Trying to identify all those, all those things is the challenge. Uh, so the example I typically use and I'll use again today is that Yakut's team sits in, in the building in which I'm responsible for. My budget pays for its debt service. It doesn't come from the institution. Uh, and when that happens, do I charge out the square footage for the area in which they sit of my debt service to this program? Because without them, the program wouldn't happen. Now, to what level of detail do you carry these budget exercises? And at some point, you drive yourself insane and you just got to say enough's enough, uh, we're close, uh, and I'm just moving on. And trying to get to that understanding of where's close enough is sometimes a challenge. 
uh, looking at the enrollment and program and student services and course setups. So these are all the cost structures around the instructional design team. Uh, these are the offering and operating costs. So just because you develop it and there's a cost structure for develop it, there's a cost structure to also operate it. So these are kind of the operating costs, the ongoing cost structures. Once things are created, we build into the budget that we thought it would be a complete course refresh every three years. So we built that in right up front, knowing that these courses change very quickly and we wanted to make sure the revenue stream down you know, downstream through the program for financial sustainability would have the ability to refresh itself because all of this is being supported off the tuition structure from the program uh, th that's coming in here. Um, and Yakut, jump in if, if you want to jump in on any of these. Uh, the course production and support and whatnot. So her team has, and we'll say a lot more about this in section three, uh, but production specialists and uh, instructional designers and videographers and all, all kinds of folks that work with the faculty and teams. One of the great things, my opinion, causes Yakut great stress, uh, is that the faculty took a while to get to the table to say that they're going to be working with a team of you know four to six people and building their course together. And this is my course. Uh, why, why, why do I have to work with this team of folks to, to figure things out? I've been teaching for a long time. I know what goes on. Um, and now they're coming back to us. You know, I've got a course that's a different one that I'm doing next semester that's a residential section. Can I have that team? So we're getting to the point where the faculty are realizing the value proposition. So one of the questions that we're starting to ask internally is, we have a center for teaching and learning. How can we work with them to scale what we're learning to all of our faculty? because these things that we're doing for the online group are finding its way back into our residential activities so all boats rise. And that's a great thing for a university to be able to do. Uh, we then modeled enrollment, so we looked at five-year projections. Um, a little crazy, I suppose. Uh, most of them have grown faster than what we projected. Uh, we actually had, uh, in the first model anyway, uh, upper bound of how fast we thought it could grow, it, you know, best case. Uh, a worst case scenario, what happens if we don't get the enrollments we want, and then we drew a line in between those two that we use for our budget projections and setting the tuition. Uh, and knock on wood, so far we've done very good, and our projections have been very close to what we thought they would be. Testament to the market research team, testament to our advisory boards. So we actually went out to all alumni before we launched these things, and we said, hey, we're getting ready to launch a program that only costs about 25% of the one you just finished last year, or 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, whatever it was. Is that going to bother you? And to our alumni credit, they all said, go for it. This will add more value to my degree because you're innovating. Uh, and so, but we did those kinds of homework checks uh, around. We talked to employers. Uh, is this going to bother you? And they said, no, bring it on. Uh, that was one of the reasons AT&T gave us the, the money because they realized they needed to move from a hardware analog world to a software digital world. And they had a huge challenge across the global workforce to be able to upskill their workforce. And this would allow them to, in part, get there. Certainly not everything they need. It's a billion dollar activity that they put in place. There's a question back here, Kim. Can you talk about how much of your enrollment strategy that you tied to the partnerships that you talked about earlier and when you were br bringing them in and the modeling of the enrollments, did you bring them in as employer connected partnerships for payment of tuition or is it all single, single pay? Uh, so ours are all single pay, although there is some reimbursement that takes place, but that's one of our big differences. Uh, in our older traditional models, the higher tuition, more than 90% of our students will seek employer reimbursement through tuition uh, plans. Uh, when we did a marketing survey of the folks in the first computer science class, 73% did not want us or them to tell their employer because the price was low enough they were going to do it. But that comes back to the financial aid question. They could afford it. What about those who couldn't? Uh, how do you afford or how do you get financial aid for part time? Uh, they're, they're wrapped around all kinds of different issues. But yes, we're seeing very different kinds of buying powers and behaviors around who pays uh, in these kinds of programs. Uh, I was even asked the question in a different form uh, not too long ago. So how much money did you leave on the table? And I looked down and I said, say what? I said, how much money did you leave on the table? When would the student pay so much out of their own wallet before they went to the, the employers to get reimbursement? You could have been charging a lot more. It's like. Well, yeah, I guess we could have, but I didn't think we were here for profit. 
I thought we were here for public good. And, and that's a big conversation. And Nelson, maybe, maybe it's useful to re-emphasize that AT&T money was a gift and it didn't really um, mandate any enrollments of their employees. We do have AT&T employees in these programs, but they went through the, the regular admissions process. The only reason we know that they are affiliated with AT&T is because they disclosed that information. So that money was really a gift. Yeah, thank you. Because and, and, there's actually some articles in the press that says it's not. But it is. It was a gift to the university. AT&T did not have any insight into driving the curriculum. Our faculty did. Uh, we asked them as an advisor to the program, just like the other industry segments on our industry advisory board, uh, what they thought. And we certainly listened to that feedback, but it was the faculty decision what's the curricula. And it's faculty that do the admissions. So you roll all those kinds of things together, you look at how many courses are needed. So again, these are part-time learners, they're not full-time learners, so that also changes the pace in which you need to roll courses out. Uh, that helps us a little bit and that we have some lag between when somebody starts and when they're going to need a course, particularly towards the back end of the degree program. Uh, but we have a handful in the analytics that are going full-time. Uh, so how do you do the course development sequencing to make sure courses are ready when students need them? Uh, and looking through that data to try to figure out what's needed by whom and when uh, to make sure that you're staying ahead of, of the expectations. And then you look at the revenue that's coming in to offset that, that included our gift activities uh, and cash flow. So another thing that university systems, at least ours, are not very good at is cash flow. Uh, they can tell you where you need to be the end of fiscal year, but cash flow within those years? Um, okay, so I've got a ton of team on, on Patrice's side uh, that that's what they do. They live on spreadsheets and other kinds of models looking at cash flow to make sure we can pay our bills uh, on a month to month basis because some of these folks are third parties. Uh, they can't wait. I mean your contract says net 30 days, right? Uh, so where's the cash coming from to make those kinds of things happen? And so that's part of what uh, her team does also. Uh, TAs is the number one expense in these programs right now. We try to maintain a ratio of 50 to 1. It's one of the things, so I'm wearing my administrator hat now, I'm really excited to see the research taking place around the AI bots. How might we be able to provide even better service to students in terms of advising and student support using technology, but still keeping human touch. Really interesting conversation at our last degree at Scale Summit uh, we had the faculty and the team in talking about what they're doing and they raised the issue, you know, all these things are built upon previous data uh, and questions that are typically asked and expectations of what they think students are going to ask. Are these AI bots and agents propagating bias? How do we use them to remove bias? We know we all have implicit bias. Many of you, I'm sure, have taken the same workshops we've taken about implicit bias. Are these tools making it better or worse? Don't know, but at least they're starting to think about it and look at it, and I think that was just a very intriguing question. But that's the level of activities that our faculty now are engaging in, in terms of these kinds of activities. So we're using the power of a research university to do research to make this better for students. And it's not just gonna be students at scale online, it's gonna be for our residential students too. So again, all boats rise. And so when you look at all those things, it rolls into a spreadsheet and we get to a point where the bottom line, the very bottom of this spreadsheet, uh, would show your net balance uh, for a given fiscal year. Uh, our history has been, and this goes before these at scale programs, is it typically takes into year three that a program breaks even. Uh, and that's on an annualized basis. That's not amortizing the costs in the previous years forward. That usually is five years, uh, if you want to think about those kinds of things. State budgets don't usually work that way. Once you've spent the money, it's spent. Uh, you're not trying to recover spent money. Uh, not sure we shouldn't be, but that's just how systems tend to work, uh, at least in our area. But that means you've got to find some way to fund these, three, these things through the third year to get them off the ground. And once you start a program, federal expectations and guidelines are is that students started, you've got to find a way to help them finish. Uh, because you need a teach out plan if you decide to close it. So managing risk was a big conversation. Risk of the students 
And what happened if one of those programs went belly up? I mean, three startup companies, the big ones. Startup world typically doesn't have a very good track record that three of three make it. How do we hedge our bets? Because we now have 11,000 people uh, and we don't have any other systems that are going to be able to do that. Uh, yet we're going to be counted on to make it happen. So how do we manage that institutional risk? How do we manage uh, lots of other risk? Uh, and looking back and giving credit to the leadership of our institution and state, I give them tons of credit for being willing to take that risk. But I also would say, and I'm saying this from my own personal perspective, being early on in this, I'm not sure we knew how much risk we were taking. So having really good teams matters. And I am eternally debted to the team in my organization, our finance office at the institutional level, the faculty, the staff, and other places across our campus for being willing to say, I'm going to find a way to do this because uh, it's the right thing to do. And I think looking back, that's going to be the tagline in the history book that people were willing to roll their sleeves up and just make this happen. And yeah, a lot of people have spent countless hours at night, not on a budget someplace, but it was the right thing to do. So with that, that's kind of an overview of the finance section. Very, very quick and high level. Again, my apologies. We spend much more time on this than a day and a half. Uh, activities. I'm going to go to the um, the Slido first, um, Nelson. So um, this question actually um, came in um, at the end of the last session, but I think it's relevant. What's the acceptance rate of your online MS programs um, uh, online, you know, online versus face-to-face? Uh, -face? So it was interesting in talking to the academic program directors of the three different programs. Uh, computer science is obviously the one with the, the most history because it's been around the longest. Um, one of the reasons for doing this from the faculty perspective is residentially in computer science, we had space for maybe 150, 200 people. That's all we could take. And they were getting thousands and thousands of applications. And they'd say, what's the difference between 150 and 151? Nothing. It's like throwing darts at a board. Is that fair to students? So I give them a lot of credit. I mean, they're making those kinds of observations saying we need to do something different. Uh, but at this juncture, what I'm hearing from them, and Yaku, correct me if you've heard something different, uh, is about 60%. Uh, are being accepted, but there's an awful lot of activity out across the student-led forums that we'll talk about later mm -hmm. about am I cut out for this program? And so they're self-selecting into this, uh, and some, Nelson's opinion, are scared to apply because they don't think they can make it. Great, great. I just uh, respectfully, Michael, I want to see if there are some SUNY questions um, for Nelson or Yakut on the finances. And I'll certainly be around a while longer this afternoon too if you're able to be around this afternoon. Yeah, Marianne. So have you done, are, are you just hiring TAs or are you also having some, I, you know, I know your population is maybe very different, um, but what about tutors or a lot of our programs use what's called a concierge as well? Um, do you have any of that kind of resource? So, uh, Yakut, I'm going to pass this one to you in just a second, but we have two forms of in the budget help at the moment, but we're adding new kinds of help. And the one is a TA, so it's a fully burdened, tuition wavered student, uh, which actually helps some of our incoming master's students be able to get funding to be residential, because they now have that funding stream and we have a source to pay them. Uh, but then we have a lot of graders, and most are graders. Uh, and we're seeing, as I said earlier, a lot of individuals who have gone through the program. So these individuals are working full time. They're in their 30s or 40s and they want to still grade because they want to be part of the conversations because they keep learning. And they've come to us and said, I'll do it for free. And we said, no, we can't let you do it for free. You got to be on the payroll and go through background checks and all those other kind of things. Uh, but they're raising their hand. They're coming out of the woodwork because they want to be part of the conversation. So we believe that we have something here that's far beyond just a degree program. It's more of a social experience that we're trying to figure out uh, as we're building these kinds of programs. Yaku, you want to talk to the others? Um, so I, mean, I think you summarized it really well. Maybe a couple of things to add. Um, Last spring, just the online Master of Science and Computer Science program hired 235 TAs. 
And since then, it's, it's even more. I think uh, right now it's about 250, and this is only in one program. So a lot of the student engagement and the delivery support is really handled by these, these TAs. Now, TAs come in different sh um, um, shades. Well, some of them are full-fledged TAs that we hire from our residential uh, computer science program or analytics program. Um, some of them, uh, to Nelson's point, um, they, they volunteer to, to do the TA work, parts of it, such as grading. So there, there are different types of, um, uh, of TAs. In the courses where there are uh, multiple TAs, there is a head TA that um, actually um, communicates directly with those TAs, and then he is the point of contact with the faculty member, he or she. And we also have, we don't have a concierge ty type of uh, person or, the, or a person who's um, responsible for a group of students and then their, um, their well-being throughout the program. Um, but uh, Nelson is currently um, chairing a, a task force, institutional task force, that looks at this student experience, student services piece. Um, the, the, the origination of the task force is really, you know, these pain points across the campus um, around serving this, you know, um, fast growing population of students. But it's also looking at what it is that we're trying to, so the, the, what are the components of this student experience? You know, student services is one piece, right? I mean, there's technology there, there's advising there, there's career counseling or career coaching there. But then, you know, things like um, concierge services. Um, we're, we're actively working on um, making this better. Um, the way that we're, we're doing it um, has differences between the computer science program and analytics program and cyber but we are trying to uh, make it a more global approach. We have, we have a lot of things to learn there. And so with the CRM system that we're putting in place, and I think we're now a year and a half into that as well, uh, we now have a team that historically has focused just trying to help get the applications to the end spot to make decisions on. But now we have them in our system, and now they're starting to say, oh, well, you didn't do so well in this course, and they reach out and they call. So the beginnings, very, very nascent beginnings of those kinds of concierge services and whatnot. But another one that through this task force that I, that I want to explore is that we have 11,000 working professionals now in this program. Wouldn't it be really cool if they could all be mentors for our residential students? So what things have we not tapped into yet and what things have we not even thought about that's right under our nose? How do we leverage it? and just being able to think differently. And also the mental wellness piece. Yeah, mental experience. wellness is one that, that we're really struggling with. like to take that one offline and talk to some of you. But you know, in many of those cases, you have to have somebody licensed in your state. I've got people all over the globe. Uh, how do I handle mental, mental wellness? Even if I did it for the US population, there are companies that do that. Am I culpable then for those who are international? And how do I serve them? You, how do you support the TA? You know, the you had six con you had six continents, twenty four countries. So, are do you have some of your that TAs? was just in the entering cohort? Yeah, yeah. So, are are you purposely picking some TAs that can provide support that's not the traditional, say, eight to midnight Eastern time? And so one of the nice things is that my staff now is, uh, I hire staff that's on the West Coast as, as well as on the East Coast, obviously. Uh, but we're also looking at Georgia Tech has a campus in France. And well beyond my pay grade in terms of geopolitical situations, but soon to be a campus in China, uh, question mark. Uh, but that would give me time zone capabilities that if I put somebody there, they could work 8 to 5 and service things 24-7. That's all part of this committee of rethinking. So the biggest picture I could say is we've, we think we figured out some, some nuances of how to scale pedagogy uh, and, and make these things happen via technology. How do we scale student services to not diminish quality, same iron triangle, uh, actually improve it uh, and, and leverage those kinds of things. And so that's our next foyer is I hope that you know two years from now we have a summit on not programs at scale but student service at scale. We represent uh, community colleges, and as such, we are an open access institution. So as I'm hearing you speak about risk management and financial models, 
Can you talk a little bit about um, how this open access um, initiative would impact those particular processes? Yeah, so uh, not, again, another great, great question. Again, somewhat outside of my expertise, but uh, let me just go tangential to the question for a second. And that every single course that's in our OMS computer science program is also available for free at udacity.com. Uh, so we're firm believers in this open access to the educa educational quality. Now you don't get faculty assessments, you don't get the discussion forum and those kinds of things other than what Udacity provides. Uh, but another model, and that financial model, is we actually license our content to Udacity and they reuse it for their nano degrees. And that's a revenue stream for us. Uh, trying to get our contracting office to think a little differently about how do you license educational products as opposed to research products has been a challenge and one that we're working through. Uh, but it's intellectual property and people want it. Uh, so how do we find ways to allow that to happen? And what happens if they translate it into some other language? Uh, what's our faculty think about that when their course was translated into uh, Farsi and they have no idea what it was translated and does it really say what I said? Uh, and so there's those kinds of things and quality assurance that has to be worked through. Uh, great question. Yesterday, would, uh, and maybe Yakut will touch on it in the next section, the ADA. How do we make sure that these things are accessible uh, from all those kinds of aspects? And when we first started down this path, most of the platforms that looked at us and said, uh-oh. Uh, and so we've been working with them very closely to make sure their platforms meet the things that we have to have for a degree. Uh, and most weren't. Uh, when we first started this. So there's ways in which I think we as higher ed can shape and advocate for the needs of our learners because startups with all the right intentions are very focused and they don't really understand the complexities in the world in which we have to operate. And it's our responsibility to help them get there. So in the sense that whenever you're starting off in your budgeting process, as you're thinking about the different buckets of expenses and the percentages that you put to those buckets, say like you have your academic cost, your student services program uh, development, and you have your other things like I operations, your IT, your uh, HR, your uh, legal, whatever, all that type of stuff. How did those percentages play out in your initial budgeting? And then how did that happen over the years, what did you what did you refine? What did that look like uh, as you continue forward? So that'd be a great question to take back to Patrice. Um, so I don't know at the line item. I know we've had a couple of surprises. I mentioned two uh, initially. I know our dean of libraries uh, hoodwinked me the other day because there was an article in some paper that we now had 50,000 new students, and of course the journal subscription rates came in up 50,000 students. Uh, false statement, uh, you know, please go out and look at our iPads data before you send invoice. Uh, but it's those kinds of conversations that, that happen across institutions. So there have been some surprises. We're doing a deeper look at budget. Again, at to what level and extent do we carry those budget models? Uh, but I don't think we've been too far off, just like we haven't been too far off in enrollment projections, which when I sit here or stand here in front of you, Wow, that's a huge testament to the people who worked on these things. And that's why I said I can't be more proud and I'm eternally indebted to them. Nelson, um, would you allow me to share a couple of examples sure. of those uh, minor surprises? I mean, they're surprises nevertheless because we operate on such a small margin. These, these small things make a difference. So one assumption that was made uh, for the second program, analytics, was to follow the TA model that uh, computer science has had. Uh, and at that point, computer science was, what, three years old? So it was, it was quite mature. And uh, we go with a ratio of you know, X many TAs and X many graders, right? Um, well, when analytics started, so the graders are typically these uh, students who are in the program who are either volunteering or doing just piecemeal work, uh, helping out the, the course delivery and student engagement. Well, when analy analytics started, we didn't really have a pool, large pool to choose um, graders from. So we ended up um, having more TAs than we modeled for. So that was that was one thing that we needed to tweak and the moment we found out. 
The other one is um, we had a certain course design process and a cost for it. So at the end of the uh, course design, we're like, okay, this is how much my team is going to get out of this. And um, we quickly figured that the very first time the course is offered, the instructional designer for that course is really staying engaged because you know, it's really the beta test and we'll talk about it a little bit in the next section. Um, so the, the course design process got longer Consequently, the the cost get, gets gets higher too. So that was that was another thing that we needed to tweak. And the third one that I can think of is because of the complexity of our technology environment. Um, uh, we'll we'll talk about this a little bit. You know, we we have Canvas, we have edX. Every time a course is set up for the next semester, there is work involved that you wouldn't normally have in a in a regular you know online course scenario. You take a course on Canvas or Blackboard, you copy it over. You make it ready for the next um, next offering, and it's not like that. It is a very uh, involved um, setup in in our in our scenario. So uh, that has a cost to it too that we we discovered that we're, we're fixing. So I'm going to make a, an executive decision because we're well past the time we said for break, and I am thankful I've not seen anybody leave. Uh, so we're either saying something or you're asleep. I'm not sure which. Uh, it's been a very engaging couple of days here for you, but let's take a 10-minute break uh, and uh, you know, do the bio things that we all need to do, check phones, whatever it is, and we'll come back in here in about 10 minutes.